to the Bulwark Coast of Hollywood. I'm Sonny Bunch, culture editor at the Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Jason Baker, uh, who's the FX supervisor and owner of Colossum Studios, uh, where he uh, he does lots of FX work and works with Tom Savini. We're, we'll talk a little bit more about the legendary uh, uh, FX guy, Tom Savini, in a minute, because uh, Jason has a great documentary about him that's hitting Blu-ray here in a couple uh, a couple weeks. Couple what, When's that? Is that next month? When's that coming out? October. October. Oh, so, uh, not till October, but you, you're going to want to get that uh, around Halloween time. It's a perfect Halloween documentary uh, for folks who are into the, the, you know, the artistry of FX. Um, but uh, today I wanted to talk to Jason about uh, his work on a movie that's coming out here in a couple weeks, uh, The Black Phone. There's everybody who has seen this trailer is struck by one thing from it. I can guarantee you that the great mask that Ethan Hawke wears. There's this great moment in the trailer where he says this face and it's he's like drawing a lot of attention to the mask. You uh, and your studio designed that mask. Yes. Tell me about that, because I find this I find this I find the the artistry of this really interesting because it is a it is such an iconic uh, look already. Um that it is uh i'm i want to know how this how this came into existence um it was really just having we got a contact from ryan turek from blumhouse and was like hey man i love all the stuff you guys have been doing with wwe and slipknot and we're doing a movie where we need a, a creepy mouse would you guys be interested so tom and i were like yeah yeah i think we can squeeze blumhouse and universal and scott derrickson into our schedule <laughs> so um you know, and then we just started talking to Scott, um, Tom. It was really Tom and then our concept artist, Levi Simpson, who came up with the initial design, you know, communicating with Scott and figuring out what they wanted. You know, the Scott Derrickson had some had ideas and, you know, things that he wanted and things he didn't want to see. Um, you know, one of the big things was definitely we're like, we need to make sure that we can see the eyes because mm-hmm. it's going to be Ethan wearing this mask if it's you know if you hide the eyes there's no reason to hire ethan because then it can just be anybody um so that was like one of the big like assignments um wanted it to look just old grimy dirty you know something that looked like we treated it like it was something that he had found and maybe modified and not created himself you know that's why it's very dirty very old very antique looking and um you know we just went from there (laughs) Yeah. So was it I was it described in the script or do you just sit down with Scott Derrickson and he says, all right, this is what there, I want to there was it, I, there was little mention of it in the script. It just I think it said originally in the script that he wear he puts on a leather double mask and just having conversations with Scott and just kind of chatting. And, you know, we I left all this up to really Tom. Tom streamlined the whole conversation and creativity with with Scott, I was in there a little bit, just kind of backing him, but they, you know, just ping ponging ideas, those two minds together came up with something absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, I threw my little two cents in here, here and there, but it was really just those guys. And then once everything was approved, I took everything over with my crew and then we created it all. You know, Tom was involved with like, you know, just overseeing the sculpt and the creation and things like that. So. And again, like even from like day one, Scott knew how he wanted to light the scenes, how it was going to be shot, how it was going to be this and that, which helped us a lot with um, kind of when we we would send test footage over to him, like do like little, you know, we'd we'd get to a certain point, like do a paint job and we knew how they were going to light it in the film. So we'd try to simulate that lighting sequence in the test footage so they could kind of see it, you know back and forth but again scott had such a vision going into it that he made our job very very easy and you know he knew exactly what he wanted and you know and i hopefully i think we satisfied his creativity yeah. so well i i mean again it looks great it's like the th- it's the thing everybody comes away with uh from that trailer so let's talk about the design so uh, i assume there there's like some sketches you're doing some sketches and then once you once you have that kind of sketched out idea, how, how do, what does your team do to make to bring that to life? Well, we took the sketches, you know, as you know, one of the many things we looked at when we were coming up with all the ideas was everything from like old like uh, Roman and Greek theater tragedy masks. Um, you know, obviously, like things like Mr. Sardonicus, we used as an inspiration for the smile. We used the uh, the Coney Island Barker mascot, you know, that creepy motherfucker. <laughs> That's terrifying. Like anytime I go like by Coney Island, I'm like, I'm just gonna go around. I don't that guy terrifies me. 
um, you know, just to give that. So in that was the beautiful part of Scott's idea and Tom's was that with the different faces, Ethan could portray different emotions in the film and stuff of that nature. So that was, I thought that was like an amazing, amazing idea. So yeah, once they, once they came up with the idea, we took it, started sculpting and molding and, you know, running, fabricating them all and painting and the whole process. We send pictures back and forth to the studio and Scott and, you know, it's, it's a process. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it's very, you know, hey, I love this. Hey, I hate this. Hey, maybe if we, can we do it this? Or, you know, I like this part. Don't like this part. Yada, yada, yada. So it's always, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a process to get to exactly where, you know, the director wants you to be with his with his vision. Yeah. I, w I want to so. talk a little bit about the actual making of the mask, because this is a, this is a thing I know nothing about. I know nothing about this yeah. part of the movie business uh, at all. But like, what what are. Uh, talk to me like I'm an idiot and explain to me what like the step-by-step -step process of making like the actual physical requirements to make like what materials yeah, are you using what, absolutely. you know uh well the first thing we had to do was we had to do a life cast we had to make a copy of Ethan Hawke's face um this was also we started everything in like late January early February of 2021 so like the vaccine rollout hadn't happened um you know, he wasn't comfortable traveling yet, obvious for obvious reasons. So we went to New York and did his life cast in his office. So it was, you know, it was fun. We kind of set up a little murder room, you know, like plastic bags and everything. You know, very, very mo like <laughs> if you walked in and saw that and didn't know what it was, you would be like, "I'm this is terrifying." <laughs> so you know, because there's plastic taped on the floor and at the wall, you know, just so we're not making a mess or anything and. And uh, yeah, and we did his life cast. He's great. He was so he was so accommodating. He was so sweet. He was so kind. Um, you know, so we were able to do that there. Um, how long is that process like? How long does he have to sit there with the thing on his face? Altogether, maybe ten minutes. Oh, that's not. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Because you always used to hear horror stories about you know they have to sit there for like six hours while the plaster sets, but it's it's faster now. Yeah, we well, we use a different material now. It's um, we use like a silicone based material so it actually kicks up a lot faster and the beautiful part of that is back when you know tom was in his heyday and he would use stuff we still use it called alginate and it's like powdered seaweed but the thing with alginate is that once you once it cures it starts to shrink hmm. over so you you will like over time it will eventually like lose its true shape and true form with the silicone we were able to just go and do just the copy of his face take it off pack it up bring it back here to pittsburgh and then run our copies of his face which we call life cast which we make out of like a, a stone ultra cal material so we were able to like not have to like go and destroy a bathroom you know yeah. tom and them you know i've heard horror stories about how they would like they'd rent these hotel rooms to do life casts on locations and just the hotel room would like get destroyed because <laughs> plaster would end up down the drains and then the showers and stuff and yeah so yeah, so you know, we brought it back here, and then um, our head sculptor Brian McGuire and Tom oversaw it. I helped out a little bit, you know. And then once we had the sculpts approved, we were able to take those, mold them. Um, had our head mold maker Sean Ronzio and myself. We made did that, and then did all the fabrication. Um, we made the masks out of a light, durable mixture of like fiberglass resin and um, like a bondo. Okay. Like for cars, so it's light and durable. Because that was the other thing, too, is that it's like, you know, if, if Ethan has to wear a mask for 12, 14 hours every day on set, we want this thing to be light. You know, you don't want it to be heavy and chunky and, you know, everything like that. So we wanted to make sure it was light and durable. Um, so I think in I think just for Ethan, we ended up making 15 variations wow. of it because, you know, I don't have you seen the film yet? I've not seen it yet. I, I, I haven't either. Next I'm, week, I'm, so. I'm very excited because usually, you know, when you work on films and you see how everything is made and you're there and you're shooting it, everything's kind of ruined. Um, this movie, we, we did everything off set, delivered them, handed them off to the amazing guys at uh, Bearded Skull Effects. They babysat them for us along with their props department. And so, like, I'm kind of, I'm going in as knowing as much as you do about it. So I'm really, really excited. What well, was that? Were, so, are you guys usually on set when when this uh, when they're when they're using the masks and the props that you guys make, or was Sometimes, this just a COVID era? Like, we we don't want to have anybody, you know, we don't want to have extra folks around and on set. 
Well, there was a prop, like they have a prop master and everything. Like we just created it. So, you know, there's no, I don't see why there was no reason to really have like mm-hmm. two groups of people, you know, yeah, yeah. sitting around getting paid to just essentially, you know, eat, <laughs> eat craft yeah. services. But um, yeah, so, you know, we didn't do that. But one of the, with the COVID protocol, we actually had to make, um, we had to make a whole secondary set for the photo double. And the stand-in because him and Ethan couldn't share. You know, you couldn't take his mask off. Oh, yeah, with the, yeah. With the, you know, stand-in wear it, and um, so that way, you know, there was no cross contamination or anything. So I believe we ended up making like forty something masks wow. altogether for the movie. It was it was quite a bit. It was like thirty. I remember it was like thirty to forty. So yeah. Yeah, like at so, one point there was just nothing but like black phone masks here in the <laughs> studio, so I was like, kind of lost count. We were yeah. just like, okay, we need this many, this many, this many, this many. So. That's, inter- that's interesting, because I never really thought about this before, but I guess you need, especially for, for something that is pronounced as this with, you know, things coming, you, you I guess you need the stand in there to properly light the shot mm-hmm. before you can have Ethan, Ethan Hawke come in with his mask on. You want to know how the, the lights are kind of bouncing off the horns and stuff. That's interesting, and considered that i and i mean and but it makes perfect sense also with the covid protocols again you know kind of fascinating change in the business oh yeah Um, absolutely have you seen have you seen have you guys had uh uh has there been a big impact for you guys uh in terms of covid you know (laughs) shutdowns production slowdowns that's what yeah actually we when covid hit we had three films and a bunch of stuff lined up for wrestlemania and we lost everything in three days I, I went my wife and i went from like we're like okay well we know what we're doing for the next six months to we should probably go do some uber eats so we can make a couple extra bucks yeah and um you know and luckily i you know i came up with the idea to start making horror themed ppes and we were able to do that and we hired a bunch of people who had all lost their jobs of friends of ours that just worked here in the pittsburgh area not even people that you know a few of them worked in the film but we had people who were like bartenders and retail people and they just everything got shut down so we were able to give them a job for almost nine months yeah and uh we got a huge huge uh huge help from the horror community so if you're watching this and you bought one of our masks thank you so much (laughs) so that's great no that's great i mean it it has been such a weird and like you know rough time especially for indie yeah, uh, indie guys like yourself. I mean, it's it's it sucks. It has sucked, but hopefully yeah. things are things are coming back. I mean, we, we, it seems like yeah, we're slowly we're slowly again. rolling back in. We've got you know we did WrestleMania last year and this year, and you know we WWE is one of our main clients, so we do a lot of stuff with them. And then we've got other films coming in, other projects. So yeah, yeah. no things are things are starting to pick back up again. So it's it's a good feeling. I want to talk about the WWE because this is really interesting to me. Uh, the the I, I'm curious about the difference between making a mask for uh, a movie and a movie production that you know is kind of in a in a more controlled environment as opposed to making them for uh, WWE or the band Slipknot, where you've got you know folks kind of running around and I mean in the WWE obviously you know, crashing into tables and and that sort of thing. How how does that process differ for you? What are you what are you trying to do? with the the masks for the wwe that you're not necessarily doing for for movie set masks oh it's we built ww like i'm so grateful for the relationship we have with wwe because it's taught me a completely different way to do stuff than compared to what we would do for something like black phone or other films you know with w you know with prime example for black phone you know most of the film movies you know there'd be someone there they'd put it on you know, actor would walk in, do their lines, say cut, moving on. The actor would slip the mask off, hand it to the prop person, prop person put it back in the phone case, move on. Or, you know, or we build specific ones for stunts or gags or whatever. For uh, for WWE, I mean, these things have to be sweated in, beat up, punched, kicked, you know, hit with chairs. And then they're shoved into gym bags, thrown under airplanes, you know, or in the back of cars. And then you know and then whipped out again shoved back on someone's face and then the whole yeah. thing done the next day so we um you know we, we've learned to really like make things very durable for wwe and those guys because you know anybody who says wrestling is fake has obviously never taken a bump before 
right. seeing what those guys go through. And, you know, the, another wonderful thing is I have a newfound respect for anyone who has decided to try to join the sports entertainment slash professional wrestling empire of just anywhere, whether you're an indie guy or a WWE guy or whatever, just to, you know, have that much desire to put your body through that is takes a certain breed and I am not one of them. Yeah, so. it's, it's definitely one of those things that changes when you see it in person, uh, as opposed to, you know, seeing it on TV or seeing clips on, yeah. on YouTube. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an experience. I, well, but so, all right. So when you're, uh, so when you're, when you're making a mask for a WWE, uh, performer, do they, do they come into you and you, do you, you, do you make the, the mold and, and all that? Like, how does that actually work? What does that Sometimes process Sometimes we like? do. Um, it just depends. A lot of times there's like wrestlers will come to us with ideas and be like, Hey, look, I have this great idea. I want to get this done. You know, can we like do it or whatever? Or, you know, sometimes we'll get calls from the creative team at WWE and they're like, Hey, we're thinking about doing this with this guy or this girl. Can you guys, you know, accommodate us? So it really, everything's just a case by case basis. What's the lead time on something like that? How long do they, do they come to you and say, Hey, we need it. Like, we need it in Dallas for WrestleMania in like four days. Can yeah, we, that's usually there? about it. <laughs> okay, that's 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 about it. Um, I think what was it two years ago at WrestleMania in Tampa? We had there was a thing where we had a girl Alexa Bliss, and she got raised up out of a uh, giant Jack in the Box, and her crown rained out black goo. Um, we had six hours to throw that whole thing together oh man um you know with no with no tools no studio so it was very lots lots of duct tape lots of duct tape and, <laughs> you know like running to home depot and yeah getting some yeah, pipe. yeah yeah very 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 indie very yeah yeah george a. romero and lloyd kaufman would have been very proud of me let's just put <laughs> it that way good. so that's good we had uh we had lloyd on the show a couple months ago was, oh uh, awesome he's, he's, he's great. great yeah he is. Uh, so I mean, you, even if you don't like his movies, you got to respect the hustle. Oh, I mean, I like I, I, I this is a, a point I was trying to make on the show is that just from a pure business perspective, it's what what he and the trauma studio guys have done over the years is nothing short of miraculous. I mean, I, like it's it's to be true indies in this day and age. Hard, yeah. Hard. No, I just hard. love seeing people like James Gunn who came up under him, giving him so much love yeah. and respect and being like yeah no like if you like my weird disney movies it came from this yeah <laughs> so. yeah uh so you are you you are making a movie with bray wyatt uh formerly of the wwe uh and and uh, and, and movie star yeah coming up. yeah yeah what's, well, tell, what can you tell me about that tell me t- give me give me some give me let me break some news here what's going on <laughs> with you and bray uh we're still you know still just working on it you know dealing with all the red tape and everything and hopefully we'll be shooting relatively soon um you know if you know anything about filmmaking there's a lot of stops and starts and you know and then something will be surefire ready to go and then the next day it falls apart and you just got to pick up the pieces and go from there so but you know Wyndham is amazing he's one of the most talented people i've ever met not just as a professional wrestler but like just as a person he's um he's just that next level of just talent and just the way he thinks the way he like does everything um he's so much fun and inspiring to bounce ideas off of and work with and come up with things so um yeah so you know we're we we got our script we got everything good to go we're just just trying to find the money people trying to find money that's always yep, that's, that's always that's the thing always and, it. yep so yeah. but you know we've got we've We've got some, we got some coals in the fire going from there. Yeah. So that's great. And you and you worked with, uh, you worked with with Bray on some of the like filmed bits for the for WWE, right? Yeah, I actually I directed the first eight Firefly Funhouse segments. Yeah, the very original ones, and I built the set, <laughs> and the mask, and the puppets, and yeah, they just yeah they they let us just run with it. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think anybody really expected it to be as popular as it became. Yeah. Um, you know, that was that was it was a blast because it was we shot it very like guerrilla style. You know, we shot it at Tom's school here in Pittsburgh. Um, built the set here. Bray flew in. 
I think like two people from WWE came and uh, they just kind of let us do whatever and went from yeah. there. And <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, uh, uh, just blew up. Let me let me ask about uh, the the masks that you make for Slipknot because again, very uh, fascinating. I mean, this is like the thing everybody knows about. I, I am not a, a Slipknot fan, but I I recognize Slipknot. If like yeah. uh, if somebody shows me, I'm like, oh yeah, Slipknot. Yeah. Uh, I, I I what what is that process like? I mean, do they come to you and say, all right, we need a new one? Uh, do you are you just sitting there like cranking out Slipknot masks all day? Like what's no the, no we what, we've only done we did one for Corey Taylor for the We Are Not Your Kind album. Okay. And what they the band switches masks. Usually, they usually switch masks every album. Mm -hmm. So that was like our one thing. And then they, um, I don't know about the other guys, but I know Corey works with different artists for every album. Okay. So okay. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe we might work on something in the future. But like we didn't do two consecutively okay. in a row. Um, yeah, I Tom and Corey have met each other a bunch over the years. Corey's obviously a huge you know fan of Tom and everything he's done. I was with a buddy of mine eric redbeard one of the former wwe superstars and we went to a show and met Corey, and we were talking and i was like yeah man you ever want to you ever want to do something with tom and i we'd it'd be a blast and you know that was exchange information and that was kind of the end of it didn't yeah. think much of it and then about a month later i get a call from Corey, and he's like hey man it's Corey taylor and i'm like okay what's up and he's like do you and tom still want to do my new mask and we're like sure let's go and uh that was that so Corey just hit us up and then like two days later he was here we did his live cast and just scraped it out so that's awesome that's awesome uh so let's talk about uh tom savini and uh your doc smoke and mirrors which uh, again blu-ray coming out in october i think it's it, it may be available for pre-order now but if not just keep keep an eye out for it uh and it is on streaming right it was on shutter now it's on tubi i, think. I believe so yeah yeah but uh, if you if you uh, are interested in the art of special effects, I mean, there's there are like two or three names in the world of special effects, and Tom Savini is the the guy. He is the the guy that everybody knows and loves and wants to 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 talk about. And I I, I really enjoyed this documentary in part because it gets at something that I had never I'd never really realized, but makes sense while watching it, which is that you know he had he got into the movie business wanting to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And kind of it almost accidentally became like the great special effects guy of his era. How did that t t talk about that a little bit and what what uh, and what that means, you know, to you as a special effects guy, but also him just as a, as a legend? Um, I mean, yeah, man, Tom is a legend. He's I don't think he's human. That's my on running <laughs> joke with Tom is Tom will say something. And I'm like, well, time works differently for us humans, Tom, like, you know you haven't aged in 30 years so but um no man so the whole thing came about was tom hired us to do he was directing a film i started did some stuff for him and we just started chatting on set one day and i was like wow this guy's like really interesting and the fact that nobody had ever done a film on tom and so i just started talking to tom i was like hey man can i just do a documentary on you in my off time he's like yeah sure I was like, well, I don't want to do it just on your effects. I want to do it on you, like hearing all these amazing stories. And, you know, one, you know, there's so many single mom stories. There's not a lot of single dad stories. That was one of the things that very, you know, intrigued me about Tom's story, and especially with his daughter Leah and everything and just finding, you know, that. And then it's like, you know, here's Tom creating all these iconic monsters and all these iconic effects in his basement in Pittsburgh and guys in like football field size studios in Los Angeles are trying to keep up with him. It's, you know, that was one of the many things that blew me away. And just like how sweet Tom is and just how kind and wonderful of a person he was. So when I, when I pitched the idea to Tom, I was like, hey, look, I don't want to just make another Blu-ray behind the scenes kind of, you know, documentary. Yeah. I more want to tell the story about the guy who, you know, threw a bunch of fake blood all over the place and then had to go make sure his daughter was up in time for school. You know, that, that story is what intrigues me. So just kind of took the human element of it. Cause I think, you know, finding out about Tom's work and his career is really easy, but finding out about the person himself, there really wasn't a lot of information out there. So that was, that was sort of the catalyst that made me want to work on a documentary for six years of my life. Yeah. 
So yeah, uh, and and again, like I said, it's 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 hitting Blu-ray finally. You said there were some COVID-related delays there. Yeah, too, right? we were we we finally got it on Shutter in 2019. Everything was going great. The Blu-ray release was supposed to be in summer of 2020, and of course, COVID kicked it all down the road, messed it all up. I think the distribution company got you know their whole everything we had out that was supposed to come out before us got all backlogged. So I think they're finally now catching up with everything. So, you know, nothing but yeah. love, you know, you can't, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't incompetence. Yeah. It was, you know, a global pandemic. So, yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about working in Pittsburgh because again, this is an interesting part of the, the Tom Savini story and also your story. I mean, I like working in Pittsburgh as opposed to like New York or LA, right? Like the big production hubs. How has that changed what you do and how you do it? Um, yeah, never, never planned on working in Pittsburgh. Just kind of life happened. Ended up hooking up with Tom, working on some stuff. I thought it would be like a three-week thing, and then I moved to L.A. afterwards, and that was like 11 years ago, and I'm still <laughs> working with him. But, you know, the beautiful part is with technology and, you know, stuff like this, like Zoom, FaceTime, emails, everything. You can kind of work from anywhere, um, you know, and go from there. So it's it's been beneficial i think um you know one of the things that you know for our size studio i think we'd pay you know 12 times as much for the same amount of space in la so yeah. which means you got to change you know charge you know 13 times as much for your you know, on your invoices and things of that nature and um i don't know man i like i've been to la i, I like visiting i love new york i like visiting but you know Pittsburgh, I, I really like it. I like that there's, it's a big city with a small town feel. It's got the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I have been to Pittsburgh. It's very nice. Great. Uh, the Warhol Museum, very nice. Go, if you're ever in Pittsburgh, go check it out. Um, well, that was that was pretty much everything I wanted to ask. I mean, I, 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 I'm curious if you guys have gotten uh, any any like pre-release feedback uh, from from folks who have you know watched the Black Phone trailer? Or I've heard have seen it at the festivals. I mean, yeah, yeah, it has been it has been making the rounds. I've talked to a few people that have seen it, and I've heard nothing but good things. You know, I'm like, guys, be honest. Tell me if it sucks. And it's like I, nobody has been like, no, they're like, it's it's amazing. It's phenomenal. I'm I'm super excited. I mean, I read. We had to read the script, you know, obviously to kind of figure out what we were doing. And um, usually when I do a breakdown or something, I'll kind of like, I'll stop at like page 60, go get a cup of coffee, come back to my office, you know, kind of, kind of you know, make make about it, make a day of it. And yeah. this one, I just, I sat down and burned, I couldn't put it down. I read the whole script in one setting, like was like, I, I, I have to be a part of this. This is phenomenal. Yeah. So. Awesome. I, I mean, awesome. Scott. Scott's amazing. You know, I mean, I mean, Sinister, Doctor Strange. You know, Emily. You know, Exorcism, Emily Rose. I mean, his his fucking resume speaks for himself. Yeah. So getting to you know getting to work with him and work for him was such an honor. Yeah. Well, I, I, I I'm just I'm curious what that. Um... I'll just ask one more follow-up question here about that because I, I am curious what that relationship is like when it is all kind of remote, right? Is he, is he, was it, was he getting masks and like sending them back? I mean, I'm, I, 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 the, the actual physical, uh, nature of it is what I'm asking about here. Like would stuff get there and he'd be like, ah, this doesn't quite work. We need to, we need to do something else or. We, yeah, we sent out, we like every day we'd send photos, photos, FaceTime, um, I think we sent like a few, we have like some software you can actually do like a 3D scan and make like a, like a mock 3D model and move it around and look at it like with your, even with your phone. Um, you know, that, that's a wonderful tool to send back and forth. So people can kind of like, you can literally just sit there and like rotate it on your phone and look at stuff. But, um, yeah, we, we sent them back and forth or send photos and they'd be like, this is great. And, you know, just went from there. Yeah. So and we'd, we'd shoot our own test footage here with it to kind of show them what we were thinking or, you know, because, you know, the, seeing it in daytime compared to how it's actually supposed to be seen where it's lit and everything, you know, they're two completely different things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, I always like to close uh, the show by asking if there's anything I should have asked. If there's anything you think people should know about what you do, 
uh, or you know, uh, again, smoke and mirrors, whatever. I mean, is there is there anything you you think folks uh, folks need to know about the world of FX <laughs> and mass creation and all that sort of good stuff? Uh, I mean, just keep supporting it. Keep going to the movies and you know, doing your thing. Yeah. So, and if you and if you're interested in it, just go pick up some clay or you know. Make some fake blood. Go make some. Go make some bad slasher movies in your backyard with your friends. Well, you uh, you were working closely with Tom Savini. I mean, are you guys pulling uh, students from his school? We do. Uh, we to... hire students from his school, like especially graduates and stuff like that. We've we've had students come in and intern. You know, do paid internships and stuff like that. But so yeah, yeah, we definitely try to give back because I was a graduate of Tom's school and trying to find anything to help me get a leg up in the industry was you know next to impossible so if we can give back in any way shape or form we do um so yeah yeah we try to try to help out a lot um you know but treat it differently than the school you know we don't expect students to come and work for free or you know anything like (laughs) that it's like this is not like you know slave labor or anything we just want people to you know if you're good and we think you're of a certain quality and you know you got a good attitude we'll put you to work awesome so uh well, Jason, thank you so much for doing the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, thank you so much um, for having me. Everybody, go go check out his work on the Black Phone, uh, which releases uh, not this Friday, but next uh, the twenty fourth, the twenty fourth, yeah. uh, and uh, and make sure to check out Smoke and Mirrors when it when it drops on Blu Ray, or you know, if it, go go stream it on Tubi uh, if you if you have the time. It's it's again, if you are interested in the world of uh, of FX, but also if you just want to know about Tom Savini, really interesting guy, really interesting life story. Um, you gotta, you gotta check it out. So, uh, I am Sonny Bunch. I'm the culture editor at the Bulwark, uh, and I will be back next week with another episode of the Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys. Later. You love Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Normal people don't write negative comments on people's Instagram. Right. They don't have to listen to this podcast. They don't have to buy tickets to come see my show. No one's forcing them to do anything. They're doing it because there's something that they relate to in me and I relate to in them. That sends chills all up my body. Yes. Give Them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.